The word of the Lord came to Zephaniah, son of Cushi, the son of Jedidiah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah, during the reign of Josiah, son of Amon, king of Judah. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. I will sweep away both man and beast. I will sweep away the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea and the idols that caused the wicked to stumble. When I destroy all mankind on the face of the earth, declares the Lord, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will destroy every remnant of Baal worship in this place, the very names of the idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host, those who bow down and swear by the Lord and who also swear by Molech, those who turn back from following the Lord and neither seek the Lord nor inquire of him. Be silent before the sovereign Lord for the, Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has considered those he has consecrated, those he has invited. <clears throat> On the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the officials and the king's sons and all those clad in foreign clothes. On that day, I will punish all who avoid stepping on the threshold, who fill the temple of their gods with violence and deceit. On that day, declares the Lord, a cry will go up from the fish gate, wailing from the new quarter, and a loud crash from the hills. Wail, you who live in the market district. All your merchants will be wiped out. <coughs> All who trade with silver will be destroyed. At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent, who are like wine left on its dregs, who think the Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. Their wealth will be plundered, their houses demolished. Though they build houses, they will not live in them. Though they plant vineyards, they will not drink the wine. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That day will be a day of wrath a day of distress and anguish, a day of trouble and ruin, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities and against the corner towers. I will bring such distress on all people that they will grope about like those who are blind because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood will be poured out like dust and their entrails like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. In the fire of his jealousy, the whole earth will be consumed, for he will make a sudden end of all who live on the earth. Gather together, gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before the decree takes effect and that day passes like wind-blown chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, Seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Thank you, Lord. This is the word of the Lord. This is, this is the word of the Lord. <laughs> the Gospel reading is Luke chapter 3, verses 1 to 
verses 1 to 9. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory Glory to you, O Lord. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius, Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Etura and Trachonitis, and Licinius, Tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths from him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptised by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So Lord, please grow us in the path of humility, in the path of obedience, as we hear you speaking now in the Scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do take a seat. Uh, we're page 644645 in the Pew Bibles. Zephaniah chapter 1. 944, sorry, can't read. 944, 945 in the church Bibles. Zephaniah 1 verse 7. Be silent for the sovereign Lord, before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. Page uh, 944. And then verse 2. I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth. This is Olivia. Where are you, Olivia? Olivia, what's this? What's this? The broom has tried to sweep. What do I do with this? Well, I don't know. What do other people do with this? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Sweep things up to clear the mess. Tidy way. One of the things that made people vote for Donald Trump, and let's not get into why that was right or wrong, was uh, he was he captured the imagination of those who thought he could go into power again and sweep things. It would he drain the swamp? That was his phrase, wasn't it? Drain the swamp. They, and he captured the votes of those who thought, yeah, we're fed up with the elite. We're fed up with those in charge. We want a, a fresh start. Clear away the corruption. In the film, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? If you've seen that film, there's a man called um, Homer Stokes campaigning for whatever political uh, position the, is going on. M- mayor or governor or something like that. And he carries a broom with him. Um, as a promise that he'll sweep away corruption. If you've not seen the film, spoiler alert, he's a member of the KKK, the Ku Klux Klan. So not so so innocent and pure after all. But there's something, isn't there, that appeals to us about somebody coming in to sweep away the rubbish, to clear up what's gone wrong, to end the corruption. Well, verse 2, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. So, 
Zephaniah starts with this saying, things have gone wrong and God is coming. The day of the Lord is drawing near when he will sweep away what is wrong. And if we sense things are wrong in society, it's kind of a great day. But let's look more closely. The day of the Lord is what Zephaniah is preaching. And that's why it's a good Advent series. Advent isn't just about waiting for Christmas uh, in a couple of weeks' time when we actually start Advent properly. It's we're looking for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. So we're looking to that day of the Lord, but Zephaniah was speaking in about the 630s BC, so you know, 2,600 plus years ago. What's he talking about? It sounds global. If you look at verse 2 and verse 3, everything from the face of the earth, man, beast, birds, fish, so on. But then he goes local, verse 4 onwards. God says, I'll stretch out my hand against Judah and all who live in Jerusalem. They're the center of, well, the ancient church. That's where they were based in Judah. Jerusalem was their capital city, the, the center of all their worship. So as Zephaniah looks ahead, he is looking to a historical event that would happen probably in his lifetime or just afterwards. He's probably, uh, it could be in his 20s when he started his ministry. So he probably saw 30 years later what happened, which is that the Babylonian superpower swept in, conquered the surrounding nations. We'll see that in chapter two next week and destroyed Jerusalem, besieged it multiple times. And finally, on 16th of March, 597 BC, Jerusalem fell. So Zephaniah is talking about something that would happen come 30 years after his preaching. But as he sees that event drawing near, it's like he sees through it to the great day of the Lord. Or maybe a way, one way to look at it is the final day when Jesus returns broke into history when Jerusalem was destroyed. It's a, a metaf- an illustration I've used before, but if you go to the cinema and watch a trailer, a trailer is like a film coming in two months' time, coming early, a small glimpse of what is coming in two months' time to a screen near you. The judgment that fell on Jerusalem was real and true and answered the corruption of, this, of the, the nation, but you can see through it a picture of what the Lord Jesus will do on the day he returns. That's why it's relevant to us today. For we are those who are waiting for the return of Jesus. It's a bit like um, the Jewish people, they knew at the end of history there would be a resurrection from the dead. But when Jesus rose, it's like the great resurrection started early in one man, Jesus. So his resurrection is the future starting early or a preview of the future. Well, this act of judgment when Babylon swept across the land was a preview of the great day of the Lord. So let's look at what uh, Zephaniah is saying in these uh, verses. First of all, let's pick it up again. Just to get the point. What's the Lord going to do? The Lord is going to sweep away false worship and idolatry. The Lord's going to sweep away false worship and idolatry. Have a look at verse uh, verse 4. I will stretch out my hand against Judah, against all who live in Jerusalem. I will destroy every remnant of Baal worship, the Baal worship in this place. The very names of those idolatrous priests, those who bow down on the roofs to worship the starry host, to those who bow down and swear by the Lord, the true God, but also swear by Molech, a disgusting God, who liked child sacrifice. 
So here is the ancient church becoming syncretistic is the word. They were worshipping God, but also worshipping other gods, the other religions around them at the time. How wicked. How wicked that they should turn from the one true and living God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and start incorporating these pagan bits of idolatry from the surrounding nations and the ancient uh, religions. How tragic when the church in our generation does the same. When you get multi-faith events in cathedrals, when Christian leaders say that all religions are called paths to God. There's one true and living God revealed in Jesus. All others are false. And let's look at a few examples of what this looked like in practice. It was worship of other gods. And we've seen that in kind of verse, uh, the Baal worship of verse 4. It looked like worship of creation in verse 5. They bow down to the, the starry host. I wonder whether some of the, uh, the, the green movement, the eco movement, is in danger of falling into this almost worship of creation rather than the creator. When people bring in policies that harm the poor for the sake of the environment and don't care about the poverty it'll bring, Preferring nature rather than those made in God's image. I think there's something that going on here. We have to worship the creator, not created things. Over in verse uh, 8, we see um, God will punish the officials, the king's sons, and all those clad in foreign clothes. So check your labels. Was it made in Bangladesh or made in um, Thailand or whatever your clothes? I'm sorry, no, that's not what it's about, is it? Here were people in God's church really keen to look like everybody else. So they were wearing foreign clothes in their context. And the equivalent for us today would be those who just, let's make the church look like the world around us. Let's just adopt the world's customs, do what the world does, try to look as like everybody else as possible, losing the distinctive of Christ and his teaching about all parts of life. And then in verse 9, on that day I'll punish all who avoid stepping on the threshold. If you look at the footnote, it says, see 1 Samuel 5, verse 5. Just a little reminder for those who don't know, centuries before, uh, the, the false god Dagon, like a fish god, had fell flat on his face before the Lord and is uh, broken on the threshold of, the, of the, um, the temple to Dagon. And so people didn't touch, they stepped over it. It's kind of an ancient superstition. And I guess in the people of Zephaniah's day, we're like, let's do some really old time religion. Let's bring in superstition from the past. A lot of, I'm told a lot of younger generation, am I still in that generation? Not really. Um, you know, there's a lot of interest, particularly younger generations of um, things that are older, things that are ancient. Many churches are finding younger adults, they don't want new contemporary, they want something that looks like it's rooted in something deep and meaningful and long-lasting. But that can be done the wrong way. Let's revive some superstition from the past. God says no. Whether it's worshipping other gods blatantly, whether it's worshipping created things, whether it's wanting to just look like the world, whether it's returning to ancient paganism, the Lord will sweep away all idolatry and false worship. And he's talking about the church of his day. His primary focus isn't the other religion out there, though they, that, that's, that's important later on, but Within the church, within God's people, God will sweep that away. What's the right path? Have a look at verse 6. What should we be doing? We should be following the Lord, seeking the Lord, 
and inquiring of him. The true God revealed in Jesus. Jesus calls us to follow him, to obey his commands, and to seek him. You see, the one true God is also the good God, full of grace and truth. So we don't just want to follow him, we want to know him, to seek him. Some gods will say, do what, you know, follow my commandments, but you're not interested in knowing that God, Molech, for example. You, you didn't want to know Molech, he's a cruel God. You might follow him, but you don't want to seek him. But the true God is the good God. We should seek him and then inquire of him. How do you, how do you see the future? What are your plans? How do you see your life developing in the future? What, do you, what, are you, what choices are you making? Do you inquire of the Lord? God will sweep away idolatry. Let's instead follow, seek, and inquire of the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, uh, verses uh, 10 onwards. The Lord will sweep away, again, the Lord will sweep away the arrogant complacency verse uh, 12 at that time I will search Jerusalem with lamps and punish those who are complacent who are like wine left on its dregs anybody here uh, a wine maker anybody here do that at home Some people have given it a go in the past so maybe you know what wine left on the dregs means I think you can correct me afterwards I think what the idea is if you, as you leave wine to mature, the dregs settle to the bottom, and occasionally you need to move it into a new com- container. Otherwise, the dregs will then come impu- um, bring impurity as it were back into the wine. So the picture is the people who are very happy where they are, very complacent, and don't want to change. They like their trade. They like their homes. They like their silver. And they think God's not that interested. Their Lord will do nothing, either good or bad. So this isn't about religion, religious idolatry. This is just get, going through life, complacently doing what we want, thinking God's not that interested. I'll just do what I want, what's best for me, or my house, or whatever it is. And God might as well not exist. Oh, you go to church on Sunday, but God might as well, Monday to Saturday, not exist. Today in the Church of England calendar uh, is a day when we're encouraged to think about safeguarding. I don't need to tell you how strange that 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 should be the focus this Sunday, after the events of the last week with the Archbishop standing down. The Macon report, which led to his resignation, points out that it wasn't just like, it was not pointing the finger at him in a particular way. What the Macon report revealed was that the terrible abuse that John Smythe had been involved in, unbelievable Abuse, beating young men. Um, that was wicked and terrible. But in a sense, the biggest scandal was the. It wasn't even a cover up. It was just, let's deal with it quietly. Let's not rock the boat. Let's not shake the system. Let's not look too closely what's been going on. The, the, the tragedy that people heard rumours, maybe knew something going on, and thought, well, let's, for the sake of our institution, our tribe, our group, let's not, let's not look too hard. Let's not bring chaos upon us if we find out what's happened and go public. Whereas when the Lord sees evil, what does he do in verse 12? He searches Jerusalem with lamps. He gets the light out. He puts the spotlight into all the dark corners. 
Safeguarding is only truly effective when we're not complacent. And if things are revealed, when we act and make sure that somebody is, is shining the spotlight to find out what really happens. The Lord will sweep away all arrogant complacency. And that's good news. That's good news because it means no one, nothing is left hidden. So the day of the Lord, he will sweep away idolatry. He will sweep away arrogant complacency. And by now we might be thinking, great, good. We want this to happen. We want the Lord to sweep away what is wrong. But as Zephaniah goes on, we realise this is a day when actually the whole world is implicated. How many anti-corruption leaders have been voted into power in some way, in some country? And five years later, we, the next cover-up is revealed because the anti-corruption leaders turn a blind eye to their things, the things that benefit their followers. As the saying goes, if you point one finger, there are three others pointing back at you. I'll count that. One, yeah, three pointing back at you. The day of the Lord is a day when God will sweep away all evil. And now, how does it make us think? When the living God shows up, are we ready? Verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. The cry on the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty warrior shouts his battle cry. That's a description of God, the mighty warrior. That phrase will be used later in chapter three, one of the most beautiful passages in the Bible. So come back in future weeks to see where Zephaniah is going in chapters two and three. The Lord is coming. He will make a clean sweep of everything. He will shine the light in every corner. So now it's no longer just them, whoever them is. It's are we ready? When John the Baptist spoke of the coming of the Lord, he called everybody to come and get washed in preparation for that day. So how does Ephraim end this part of his sermon? Let's look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 as we come near to an end-ish. How should we respond? <clears throat> gather together. Gather yourselves together, you shameful nation, before the decree takes effect and that day passes like wind-blown chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes upon you, before the day of the Lord's wrath comes upon you. Don't stand there thinking, well, we're fine, Those are in, they are in trouble, Gather yourself together, my church, says the Lord. Verse 3, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you'll be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Historically, in Zephaniah's day, uh, king Josiah, he's speaking in the reign of King Josiah, was a pretty good king. He, in, in, a, in a smaller measure, swept away some of the corruption. It's quite possible that Zephaniah's preaching brought about a renewal in his day that meant the day of the Lord was delayed. But it was still coming. The previous kings, Ammon, two years. Before that was um, Manasseh, 55 years of, of a deeply wicked king. The day of the Lord was approaching and it would not stop. It might be delayed when the people responded, but it was coming. And so 
The message of Jesus' return is not there's a way to escape it. It's there's a way to find shelter on that day. There is a way to get ready for it. There isn't a way to stop it. Jesus will come with his broom in hand and sweep away the idolatry, the complacent arrogance, the the turning a blind eye to wickedness, all that goes on. But how can we be ready now? Seek the Lord. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Ultimately, these verses take us to the Lord Jesus Christ, who came early, as it were, ahead of the day of the Lord, to prepare the place of shelter, to be the place of shelter. Zephaniah makes us look forward to the cross. When just as the judgment in AD 5, so BC 597, was a preview of the future judgment, so when Jesus came and died on the cross, that future judgment fell on him. And he became the place of shelter. As we come to Jesus, who died for us, we are seeking righteousness. We know that we are impure. We know that we are complicit in the sins of the world. But there is a way to be made right in God's sight. It's because Jesus died for you. Out of love. Who, who became the shelter. As we left the vicarage to come this morning, Caroline grabbed the, the, um, the umbrella just in case it rains. So that if the rain came down, she at least was sheltered out of the storm or the drizzle, whatever it might be. Jesus is the one who becomes a shelter because he shields us from the judgment of God against sin. But as we come to the cross, we have to be changed. We cannot but be changed if we come to Jesus' death for us. We'll be humbled, seek humility. Surely Christians should be the most humble people around because we see that our only hope is the Lord Jesus standing in for us as a shelter. As we come to Christ crucified, we discover that the other religions really are rubbish. No other religion has a God who loves us and saves us. Just as a matter of fact, other religions don't have the idea of salvation. Reward, maybe, but not salvation. Jesus is the true God who comes to save. And Jesus is the true God who shakes us out of our arrogant complacency. Who by his death shines a light on our sin and shines a light on our salvation. On his death for us. The cross is where we seek the Lord. The cross is where we seek righteousness, forgiveness, cleansing. The cross is where we become humbled. Humbled by the depth of God's grace towards us. So Advent, a couple of weeks time, maybe you're getting ready, maybe you've got decorations up already, maybe the Christmas music is playing, maybe the tree is ready, decorated to go. You're getting ready, but are we ready for the day of the Lord? He will come to one day to sweep away all sin, all corruption, all violence, all abuse. He will sweep it all away. What a day! But are you ready? Seek the Lord. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Come to Christ, crucified for you. Let's pray. Lord, gracious, sovereign God, we rejoice that there is a coming day when you'll sweep away what is wrong and shine the light that reveals all hidden darkness. 
But help us be ready. Lord, help us be ready by worshipping only you. Help us be ready by being those who are prepared to stand up against evil. Help us be ready as we come to Christ. We thank you that you sent Jesus into the world to be our place of shelter, to be our righteousness, to humble us and then lift us up as your beloved, saved people. Prepare our hearts, Lord. Change our lives. May we live now knowing that you will act, but have already acted for our salvation and for our good. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.